Compensation being sent out is actually an external call that sort of tries to increase the size of the call stack. If you were to call this with a pre-constructed call stack of about 1,023, then what would happen is that contract would continue executing, except this particular line would fail, but the contract would still continue to go on and dethrone him. So he's essentially robbed of his investment. So let's, let's consider how we can solve this. But before we do this, let's consider the two parts that we're going to see. We've developed a smart contract analyzer that we call Oyente, and we've developed an improved sort of formal semantic that we call Etherlight. So but let's just see where they fit in. Currently, we have source code that's written in the language that you saw earlier, Solidity, that's then compiled into bytecode and then posted to the Ethereum blockchain as transactions. And those are executed later by the miners. Oyente is the first level of defense. It lets you catch bugs before the contracts are deployed out there. It operates on bytecode, and they're run by the owners of these contracts to see if there are any bugs occurring. Etherlight is meant to be an update to the way that contracts are executed on the blockchain. So that would give you a way to sort of patch these bugs from occurring. But the, re the reason we have two of these parts is because updating the blockchain, updating software on the blockchain, which is called a hard fork, is often very realistically hard. That would need all the miners to agree and update their software to move on to the next part of the next version of the software. Let's consider the architecture of the tool, the first part of it. It's built around symbolic execution. We'll explore that in the next slide. The architecture is also highly modular, and we'll see the parts here. Operates on bytecode, which is produced after compilation, because source code on the Ethereum blockchain is very scarce, because source code tagging to bytecode tagging is a, is a very manual process. So what happens here is you have contract bytecode and the state of the Ethereum blockchain. Those are your inputs. The bytecode is then fed to a CFG builder, which builds a basic control slow graph of what's happening. The explorer then uses an entry point from the CFG builder and the current block state to symbolically evaluate instructions from the entry point. It queries the Z3 prover, which we'll see later, as to whether these branches are feasible and explores all the feasible and reachable instructions. The core analysis module, which is the one that finds the bugs, checks for the existence of any possible problems from this output. The validator then checks for false positives. This is far from complete at this point. The module currently simply checks Z3 to ensure that any problems found are only in feasible paths. The visualizer then provides a graphical output of what's happening, the control flow graph, the output, the results of bug execution. And the modular design of the tool, as we've seen, allows for easy swappability of different parts to increase test coverage. For example, one proposed addition that's coming up is a module that can increase or estimate worst case gas consumption for contracts. Now let's consider symbolic execution. Very quickly, let's have a primer. Let's, uh, symbolic execution using Z3 in, the, in, the, in Oriente lets us perform path checks that enable bug detection. Symbolic execution first represents the program variables as symbolic expressions of input values, which then arbitrarily, sort of statically reason about the feasibility of the paths in the program. For example, consider a control flow graph that is constructed by the CFG module we've seen earlier. The graph represents the possible paths of execution in the program. Let's consider a single path from this. Now, the execution represents the variables along this path as symbolic variables and constructs path conditions that have to be fulfilled for this path to be successfully executed. Once these path conditions are found, the theorem prover, Z3, is used to evaluate whether these paths are feasible. Once we've completed this, then the CFT module is done. This is often faster and more comprehensive to implement tests for than dynamic testing, where a program is tested input for input. Symbolic execution also makes it easier for us to reason about the validity of contracts, the analysis of which often involves comparing interleaving paths and the exploitation of intermediate states. Oyente, once again, as I mentioned, performs a static analysis on bytecode due to a lack of available source code. But we move beyond simple static analysis as the Explorer module would dynamically generate edges for the CFG that couldn't be found statically. Now, here are the solutions we have for how we detect these bugs. For transaction ordering dependence, the different paths that we find are analyzed for possibly concurrent ether flows. If two separate flows have money going through them, Oyente reports it as a TOD contract. For timestamp dependence, there's a special symbolic variable that's associated with the timestamp. If there are any paths affected by this special symbolic variable that lead to a payout, it's, it's detected as a timestamp contract. Detecting a mishandled exception is simply bytecode analysis. 
there's a call instruction for every external contract call that's going out. And this instruction will place a return value on top of the stack. If there is no instruction that checks for the return value, then we call it as a possible mishandled exception. Finally, for the reentrancy bug, this is slightly more complicated. We look for call instructions, again, which are external contract calls. And we, at that point, when we find them, we try to evaluate what the path conditions are that led to this call. We then see if it's possible to re-execute re that call instruction by calling the contract again. So we have to ensure non-repeatability. If the contract can be called again in such a way as that the call will fire, then that's a reentrancy bug. Finally, Etherlight is a new set of semantics. A few things we were considering when we developed Etherlight. The first of which is maximum conformance to the existing system. Because it's proposed as an upgrade to the existing blockchain, we had to have as minimal of a change that would work because that improves the possibility that it would be adopted. The second is backward compatibility. We wanted to develop a system that would work and patch existing contracts and transactions in the blockchain so that they remain valid. And here are the solutions. The first is that of guard conditions. And now this deals with the TOD problem that we saw earlier. The rules of transaction execution have been modified on the network to accept a guard condition such that the transaction is not processed if the guard condition isn't met. The guard condition can talk about the state of the blockchain or the state of the contract. And for transactions that do not specify the guard condition, the guard condition is simply set to true and the transaction moves on as, as before. So let's look at the previous example. Let's see the transaction that was trying to buy 100 stocks at $1. The expected result here is that the stock is sold at the right price, but we've seen that when there's a competing transaction, the, there's a possibility of a sort of unexpected result. But if the user were to introduce a guard condition stating that the price be exactly what he's seeing, then the transaction will either successfully execute or not at all. The second is of a deterministic timestamp. The timestamp variable has been replaced with the block index to model the time in this network. Since the average block time, the time between blocks being generated, sort of adjusts to about 12 seconds, this can provide a representation of the time, but without obfuscating the true granularity of what's being provided to the user. So we can see how this would work. A, time, a, a, a timeout of about 24 hours can be replaced by an equivalent measurement of the block index. And the longer the timeout, the more accurate it's likely to be. The next is better exception handling. And this is simply done by ensuring that exceptions are fatal unless handled they will always be propagated back up the call stack and will result in a transaction rollback if they're not handled. This would prevent attacks that take advantage of mishandled transactions. The final one is to prevent reentrancy, And we've done this here by restricting the amount of gas. This is the fuel for computation on the Ethereum network for the call instruction. Now what this means is that when you allocate a lower amount of gas for an outgoing call, there is a very limited amount of computation that can be performed by the receiving contract. And this often is enough to prevent re attacks where it would call the calling contract one more time to get a larger payout. The experimental setup was originally run on about 19,000 contracts. This was at the time of writing. And like I mentioned, now it's about 200,000 and still growing. We ran it on a 30 minute timeout per contract, uh, about a one second timeout per request. This is because of the high, uh, there's a high amount of RAM usage being uh, taken up by the contract, and often contract evaluation will take a long time. From a preliminary analysis of the, blo of the blockchain, we found that we needed to implement up to about 63 instructions to have maximum test coverage. We can see the results of the benchmark here. We found about 45% of the contracts we analyzed were flagged as a bug, of which about 1,600 are distinct contracts. Exception mishandling is the most common, with about 5,000 contracts being affected. We operate, again, on the bytecode of Ethereum contracts. And while source code analysis would have provided more insight into the purpose of the contract, uh, about 175 out of the 8,000 we found had source code for analysis. And false positive evaluation was done manually on these contracts. The false positives that we found resulted from a lack of communication of the intent of a contract. What this means is that often in bytecode, what the developer intends the contract is doing doesn't come through. Now, say for example, a contract may call multiple external contracts and make multiple calls without any exception handling, as if that were the normal case, and Oyente would flag it as a problem. 
But when you look at the source code, sometimes it's apparent that all of these contracts were written and operated by the same person, that the contracts are part of a much larger system, in which case it, it becomes not an exploit. Finally, the tool and the accompanying benchmarks we can find here. There's an automated Docker pipeline that makes setup very easy. Uh, it's also been integrated into the Ethereum code base, so you can find it there as well. Etherlite is described in much more detail in the paper. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm gonna uh, abuse my power here and ask the first question. So you mentioned for the reentrancy attack, you wanted lower default uh, gas yep. costs. Obviously, the recent hard fork is about how gas costs were underestimated and they need to right. be raised to prevent denial of service. So in general, I mean, could you talk about sort of if there's a way to extend your framework to catch issues like that that aren't bugs but are sort of really sort of more subtle issues that arise in uh, smart contract development? I think, I think that's a very good question in the sense that uh, when the original gas values were determined for Ethereum, uh, it was mostly based on the number of milliseconds it would take for the instruction to execute. So uh, some of those were estimated wrongly. And if you guys don't know, uh, there was a recent DOS attack against the, the network that resulted in the gas values being updated. Now, the, the thing we're doing here is by lowering the default gas value, we're making it almost prohibitive of anyone to run more than just basic, a basic update of their balances. So your average contract wallet in Ethereum that keeps track of a person's money will just be able to update the amount of money that they have. There wouldn't be any external attacks possible. But I agree in the sense that there needs to be a better way for determining gas, uh, which is exactly how you would pay for each instruction for Ethereum. I don't think we have one yet. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for your really timely work. You must have been working on this then before the DAO came out and it like drops right into place kind of, yeah. as a pretty serious motivation. Um, could you say a little bit more about what the difference is between Etherlite and then say the, 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 the current specification? Like it's a matter of I think you're approximating it just um, as kind of like for simplicity. And sure. My, my other question, maybe these then, then relate, is um, I think what you're saying is that your proposed solution is to prevent re-entrancy of, uh, of any kind, um, or even expensive gas things, but, but re-entrancy on its own isn't a bug, right? Like you might have some legitimate use of re-entrancy that doesn't cause the bug. Okay, so I think I'm, I'm gonna answer the second one first. Okay. Uh, for re-entrancy, I think the issue there, you're right, is about the intentions of what's being done. But I think you can save to say from what we've seen in the blockchain is, you can effectively, if you wanted to, prohibit re-entrancy into the original calling contract without affecting, we've ne we haven't seen any valid examples of re-entrancy being properly useful. That wouldn't be incorporated, better incorporated into a larger contract or a much smaller system of contracts, right? Uh, and as far as the, the first question goes, Etherlite was built from a sort of reduced set of semantics built from Ethereum. So Ethereum was simplified down to its core blocks that we used to construct a semantic for how contracts are being run right now. And then we introduced these features on top of it. Does that, does that help? Are, are, what, um, what are the main features that are missing in Etherlite that are present in Ethereum? Like it does include calls like to other contracts, right? I think what would be missing in Etherlite is just that it's operating on a reduced set of instructions. Only the instructions that were deemed pertinent were incorporated into Etherlite. And Etherlite isn't functional, it's just, it's just a basic semantic for how contracts can be run better. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, uh, any other questions? All right then, uh, let's thank Rishi again.